Hello, everybody. Welcome. That is by far the best intro Zoom music I've ever heard. So thank you for that. Um, before we get started, thanks all so much for being here. If you can just take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat, where you're tuning in from, what brings you here today, that would be great. I can start with myself. My name is Jane Chung. I use your pronouns. I run campaigns at the Worker Agency on a range of issues spanning gig worker labor organizing, surveillance, and of course, big tech accountability. I am speaking to you all today from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm so honored to be facilitating this conversation today. But before we formally introduce our speakers who really don't need any introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway, I wanted to set the stage and lay out some of the stakes for this conversation because I really don't think it could have come at a better time. There are some folks who are calling this summer, the summer of 2022, the hot antitrust summer. Others are calling it the hot privacy summer, at least here in the US. Um, I personally don't see why it can't be both, and I hope it will. But there are several reasons for that. There is a suite of serious bills to rein in big tech's monopoly power over markets that may be coming to a vote on the Senate floor in the United States Congress in the coming weeks. Also, uh, this week, uh, there was introduced a bipartisan bicameral privacy bill by uh, House and Senate leaders, and it's been announced that there will be a hearing for that bill next week as well. So progress is being made, but we know that the US unfortunately lags behind other countries in regulating digital rights and competition. Many of us know uh, about some of the policies in the European Union, but also in other regions, particularly in Latin America, where one of our speakers today has been moving work in for decades. So we've been asked by the good folks at RightsCon here to address this question over the next 40 minutes or so. How can governments regulate the tech industry to protect consumers and their privacy, ensure market competitiveness, and hold companies accountable? I also would love to add on a few more layers to our conversation, and I invite our speakers and, and all the folks tuning in to keep this kind of rolling around in the back of your minds as well. The first question I'd like us to keep in mind is how we broaden the questions of privacy and antitrust and look at them in concert with one another. Because the way I see it, and I think I suspect some others here might agree, questions about corporate accountability and consumer protection involve not only antitrust, but also privacy, surveillance, civil rights, racial justice, and a number of other areas, which I hope we'll get to explore together. Second, we're really lucky to have two experienced leaders in different parts of the world today. So I wanna pose the question, how can we share knowledge in and across our countries and what can we learn from one another? And lastly, how do we think about using privacy and antitrust policies and tools to proactively advance equity, building power for our most vulnerable communities by race, class, gender, sexuality, and otherwise? So thank you all for being here once again. Please feel free over the next 30 minutes or so to drop your questions that may come up into the chat box. We will leave 10 to 15 minutes towards the end for our speakers to answer some audience questions. So without further ado, I am so honored to introduce our two speakers today. First, we have Maria Paz Canales, who is the Global Policy Advisor at Derechos Digitales. Maria Paz was part of the team that founded Derechos Digitales in 2005. In 2016, she joined the organization's board of directors and from 2017 to 2021, she served as the organization's executive director. Maria Paz's work includes the development and use of new technologies from the perspective of intellectual property, free competition, telecommunications regulation, and privacy. Maria Paz is a lawyer from the University of Chile and has a master's degree in law and technology from the University of California, Berkeley. In 2015, she participated in the Google Policy Fellowship Program at the Center for Democracy and Technology. 
and later was an intern at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Thank you so much for being here, everybody, with us. Second, we have uh, Commissioner Rebecca Kelly Slaughter of the Federal Trade Commission. Commissioner Slaughter was sworn in as a Federal Trade Commissioner on May 2nd, 2018. She brings to the commission more than a decade of experience in competition, privacy, and consumer protection. Along with advocating for consumers, particularly those traditionally underrepresented and marginalized, Commissioner Slaughter strongly supports working families and work-life balance. Before joining the FTC, Commissioner Slaughter served as chief counsel to Ch Senator Charles Schumer of New York, the Democratic leader. Commissioner Slaughter received her BA in anthropology magna cum laude from Yale University and her JD from Yale Law School, where she served as an editor on the Yale Law Journal. She lives in Maryland today with her family. So let's get into it. Thank you both for being here. It's a interesting time, as I mentioned earlier, big business and in particular big tech has been digging deep into its coffers to attack potential antitrust regulation and enforcement here in the US. Just this morning, the Wall Street Journal reported that big tech has spent $36 million in advertising against bills that threaten their dominance. There also seems to be a perception in some parts of DC that privacy and antitrust are somehow at odds with one another. And to work on one would only be possible at the exclusion of the other. So I thought we could open this up by setting the record straight. I wanna play a quick fire round of agree or disagree around common beliefs or misconceptions around antitrust so we can set the record straight here for once and for all. Um, so please, I'll put out a number of statements, tell me whether you agree or disagree and why. And just for ease, let's start with Maria Paz and then have Commissioner Slaughter respond afterwards. So here's the first statement. Competition is at odds with innovation. Maria Paz, do you have any uh, response to that? Of course, I totally disagree. <laughs> and precisely it's the opposite. It's a false dilemma uh, when you try to, to point it out that regulation can uh, negatively impact um, uh, innovation or antitrust enforcement can uh, negatively impact innovation because innovation always has been about how to create an ecosystem that is really alike, that allows that not uh, the, the usual subject are the only ones able to innovate, but keeping the diversity and the possibility of uh, challenging continuously the, the previous uh, technology uh, development. So precisely what uh, the, the competition enforcement, the antitrust enforcement or the regulation uh, uh, for, for antitrust is looking for is uh, to restore that environment of innovation that it was uh, the, the principle of uh, the, the technology uh, itself, but that in the recent time in the digital environment uh, had been, uh, been loose uh, on the hands of the, the few global big uh, tech companies that increasingly have concentrated the ability to innovate through the handling of uh, key resources uh, for innovation for example, data, and that is where the, the issue connect with the privacy uh, topic that you were mentioning. So I will stop there for, for keeping the flow of the conversation. Thank you. Commissioner Slaughter, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, I think Maria Paz put it very well, but um, not only do I disagree that competition and innovation are at odds, I think competition is necessary for innovation. And the simple way to put that is monopolists have no incentive to innovate. Um, they can control a market statically, uh, and they don't have any incentive to develop new or better products because their market power protects their share. What we want is a competitively healthy marketplace where new entrants are continuously showing up with better ideas, better technology, better quality services, lower prices, um, better working conditions, the entire uh, panoply of improvements that you don't see absent meaningful competition. Thank you, Commissioner Slaughter. 
you let's have you uh respond to this next one first then uh what about the statement that competition policy threatens america's global competitiveness yeah i think that that's another um really damaging straw man argument um it's it's made in two different there are two different flavors of that argument that i hear one is um global efforts to rein in big tech companies are just protectionist ways of punishing American success to elevate uh, foreign competitors. Um, I think that's pretty demonstrably false. I also think companies that choose to participate in the global economy have to um, take with it the cost of participating in the global economy, which is being subject to to uh, global rules. And if there are competition problems in other markets that are addressed by, you know, for example, the DMA, then that's something that companies who choose to participate in Europe get to choose to subject themselves to. Uh, the more pernicious version of this argument, I think, is the one you're pointing to, which is the national security one. This argument that if we um, improve platform competition in the US or we limit the market power of large platform incumbents in the US, we are necessarily empowering foreign adversaries like China. Um, you mentioned that I had worked in the Senate before I joined the FTC. In addition to competition, consumer protection work, I did a lot of national security work. And so I take the issues of national security extremely seriously. And I think we absolutely need to be worried about um, companies controlled by nation states that may be bad actors. But the remedy for that is not monopoly. Um, the remedy for that is vibrant competition among non-nation state actors. So if we are concerned about national security, our remedy is not a monopolist in the US supply chain. It's vibrant competition and diversity in the US supply chain because that is how we insulate ourselves from attack. And while you know it's not in the technology space necessarily, but we see across the board where we have supply chain shortages that um, monopoly bottlenecks really exacerbate security concerns because when there's a problem with one, we have no fallback. And so that is part of why healthy competitive markets are actually really essential for national security, um, not protecting monopolists. Thank you, Commissioner. Maria Paz, you obviously work in a different geographical region, but do you want to respond to questions about competition in relation to national security or uh, global competitiveness in the region that you work in in Latin America? Sure, from, from my region, there are two elements that are really relevant to highlight, I, I believe. One related with uh, the, the, the digital and the technology sovereignty that is not possible to really uh, achieve or explore even when you have these big tech companies that are dominating the market uh, globally. So that is, that is the case for Latin America, that many of the companies that uh, we uh, have here providing services are not from the region. And because of their dominance, there are little chances that local uh, alternatives can grow and, and be successful. So uh, all the regulation or the antitrust enforcement can be very helpful in terms of uh, really uh, provide a fair opportunity for local innovation. And with that, not only local innovation, but also digital sovereignty for our region and for our countries. Because uh, as you mentioned, as Commissioner was also pointed out, uh, technology is uh, entangled, uh, very intimate uh, with the use for, for surveillance, for national security purposes. And all the data, for example, that is collected and used for implementing some of these um, technology applications that are provided by these global companies go out from the hands of the of the governments or the people that it's uh, in this side of the world. So I think that there is a very relevant uh, uh, element in that sense in, in terms of uh, finding a, a, a fairer equilibrium uh, in, in the global relationships in terms of uh, having 
find opportunity of uh, balance uh, in, in some way, the possibility to access, to control technology and to benefit back from the, what technology is being developed. Because in many cases, for example, all these technologies that are provided by these global monopolies, uh, they are fed, uh, fed uh, with the data and the elements that are provided locally in other regions of the world. But the value is captured finally by, by those companies, uh, the monetary value, but also the possibility again to use that as an, uh, a part of the raw material for, for uh, future innovation. So all that uh, needs, uh, of course, that regulation take place uh, and antitrust enforcement take place in order to try to um, uh, balance a little bit more the possibilities of uh, participation in these digital markets for local actors, regional actors. Thank you, Marifas. This last one, I want to zoom in and spend a little bit more time on. I want to ask both of you how you see the relationship between antitrust and privacy. We've touched on it, but uh, what are some examples of, of cases that you've seen recently or in history where these two areas intersect? And what can we learn from those experiences? Commissioner Sauter, let's start with you. So I think this is another area where uh, antitrust and privacy can be at odds if they are not done thoughtfully. So for example, you could envision privacy regulations that would enhance the power of large incumbents and allow them to be the only ones who participate. So build on their market power, even though they're nominally privacy protective. That would be bad. We don't want that. That is not the only way to be privacy protective. And in fact, you could see privacy rules that would facilitate competition and diminish the ability of large players to build market power by amassing huge amounts of data on people across their ecosystem. So um, I think this is one of those areas where you have to be thoughtful and careful. Um, the details really matter, but in fact, protecting personal autonomy, personal data, and um, the operation of a free and fair marketplace are absolutely in concert with each other. Maria Paz, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, of course, I agree with uh, everything that the uh, commissioner was pointed out. I will, I will add as a recent example of this and how uh, a global movement is starting to articulate around the intersection between uh, competition, data protection, and consumer protection is the recent case of a WhatsApp change of uh, terms of conditions and, and privacy policy. Uh, personally, uh, as part of my organization, and my organization joined many organizations around the world that were questioning this updating of condition that it was uh, not very uh, deep in terms of what previously uh, had been uh, done by the company in terms of collection of data, but it was an opportunity to question the, the, the successive changes and, and the increasing uh, amount of data that uh, was being collected and shared with other uh, services of the same parent company. So in, the, in this case, Meta, uh, all these are Meta companies and, and WhatsApp was starting to share, or was already sharing uh, since 2016 data uh, with Facebook. So I think that the intervention in many cases in, uh, uh, of different authorities around the world for making question to the company about this change of, uh, of terms of service and, and the uh, privacy policy pointed out that really uh, the, the fact of, uh, of collecting a big amount of data and, and, and being able to uh, cross this data between different services applications in which uh, the company uh, had dominance around the world particularly pose uh, questions that are linked with competition, with consumer protection, and with data protection. In many countries in which these questions uh, arise, um, there are already in place a strong uh, data protection uh, laws, as the, the case of the European countries that make uh, this case and, and, and started to question the, the, the movement of the company. Uh, in others, for example, in Chile or in Argentina or in Brazil, uh, there, there 
there is data protection legislation, but we perceive it that the ability of the authorities to intervene in these cases, it was uh, uh, limited because of the institutional shortcomings that in many uh, countries uh, in Latin America, the institutionality for antitrust uh, enforcement has still. But in all those cases, what we uh, see is that the uh, institutional cooperation between the data protection authorities and the competition authorities and the consumer authorities to evaluate this case in order to identify what will be the harmful consequences for the users, it was fundamental. So for example, in Argentina, we have uh, two decisions, one that come, came from the con uh, consumer authority that it was uh, fining the company for the changes and also a resolution, a dictamen uh, from the competition authority that was condemning these changes. And in the case of Brazil, for example, it was a joint resolution uh, for the consumer authority, the competition authority and the data protection authority that pointed out a number of conditions to the, uh, to the company in order to uh, provide transparency and also limit uh, the interchange of data uh, that it was uh, either identified. So I think that this is very promising and it's a proof that uh, the, the privacy protection and the competition or antitrust enforcement can go hand in hand, in hand and, and the same with consumer protection. Jane, can I jump in just to build on what Maria Paz said there? Sure. Because um, I think the example she gave highlights exactly the problem with how we have historically done privacy in the US at least, which is sort of through this notice and consent privacy policy model, um, which is problematic from a privacy perspective and a competition perspective. And I just wanna tease that out a little bit. Noticing consent makes a ton of sense for a system where notice is meaningful and, and consent is meaningful. But privacy policy terms and services are almost entirely unintelligible, even to sophisticated attorneys who specialize in this field, right? I read them, I don't always understand what they mean. Um, and if I can't understand them, that's a problem. And then even if I do understand them and I don't like something that they're doing, there are a lot of these services that I need to join, to participate in society, whether it's for my job or to access healthcare or just to find out information about a local business. And I don't have the opportunity to go to the company and say, well, I am comfortable with provision one and two, but I'm not okay with provision three in your privacy policy. You just have to click accept and move on. And you can't vote with your feet because you are already invested in whatever the platform or the infrastructure is. And so you can't so competition can't provide a meaningful check on policies and practices that may be problematic, which is what competition is supposed to be able to do. And so this is an area where um, I think you see really clearly why competition is important and why more meaningful substantive limitations on how companies can collect and use data is important because simply creating a laundry list of mandatory opt-in or opt-out choices isn't going to provide that meaningful protection or give people realistic choice. Thank you both for that. Uh, before I dive into this question, which may be our last topic together, just a quick reminder to folks tuning in, please uh, leave any questions you have for Commissioner Slaughter or Maria Paz in the chat box and we will get to them shortly. Commissioner Slaughter, you have talked about how antitrust can be anti-racist. In fact, I think you've said and written that antitrust should be anti-racist. I wanna ask you how you think that your work at the FTC can be actively anti-racist in the realm of antitrust. And if you can get as concrete as possible about how we can change the status quo. Thanks. Uh, this is a great question and a topic about which I am extremely passionate. Uh, the way I would articulate it is as follows. We have extremely limited resources as an enforcement agency. In fact, I was thinking about it when you mentioned that big tech has spent $36 million just on advertising to defeat legislation. 
that's 10% of our annual budget for all of our enforcement work. Um, and it is like a drop in the bucket for them. So our resources are limited. We can't do everything. Um, so the question is of, and there are many, many problems, competition, consumer protection out there where law enforcement would be appropriate. So the question for us is how do we deploy our limited resources? How do we set priorities among those limited resources? And the point that I have been trying to make is, I think it is better for us to deploy those resources to uh, remediate and mitigate harms that disproportionately affect already marginalized um, communities and and populations. And so, because oh, the choice is do that and try to make our economy and our markets a little bit less inequitable and unequal, or deploy them in ways that reinforce the structural inequity and inequality that we have. So to be concrete about it, if we're choosing between, um, let's say we have two cases in front of us and we don't have the resources to litigate both of them. We have to make hard choices. We can't do everything. Maybe that means we prioritize the hospital merger challenge where a community hospital that provides services to underserved populations is being eliminated through a merger over the uh, merger between large, expensive business services companies that where the harm is going to fall disproportionately on already extremely wealthy businesses. Um, you know, I think we have to think not only about what the quantification or qualification of the harm is, but who is harmed and how are they harmed? And so how do we do that in practice? I mean, starting with visibility into the populations that are affected by the work that we're considering. And that means not just the consumers or patients and users of products, but who are the workers at the companies that we're talking about? I think a really important aspect of this focus has been considering the monopsony effect of concentration on workers in particular. And that has um, antitrust angles. It also has, uh, there's some consumer protection angles. So for example, the, the case that we brought against Amazon for misleading its flex drivers about whether they'd get to keep their tips. Um, I think that was an important case that sounds in this uh, entire universe of focusing our resources on the population who most need the help of the government rather than the people who can afford to help themselves better. Maria Paz, you work in a different context where obviously the structural inequities are a little bit different, but I wanna ask you a question in the similar spirit, which is how you think about approaching your work, whether in antitrust or privacy, to ensure that you're promoting equity among the most marginalized among your communities? Sure. The first thing that I, I want to point it out that maybe is obvious, but maybe not so obvious for our uh, current audience because not, not everyone is familiar with uh, antitrust or, or competition law and, and doctrine, is that finally antitrust or competition law, it's about power. Uh, people, when when they hear the, the 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 words, they think in economics. They they think in 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 in, in that area. That is true because uh, uh, um, power is linked with money. But ultimately, what it's about and what uh, why uh, antitrust regulation was created in the first place is to control power. And uh, of course, power is <laughs> strictly related with uh, who holds the power in society and, and who don't, and who suffers the consequences of the, the entities that hold the power and make decisions in their own interest and not considering the interests of the marginalized population. So in that sense, I will say that um, antitrust enforcement or, or competition regulation in, in, in different regions of the world, and particularly in my region in Latin America, is relevant because if 
we don't do that, finally, who get to decide many of the uh, technological deployment that uh, are being implemented in our region are these global dominant companies or are the governments that are dealing with those global uh, dominant companies, but not always taking into consideration in the, in the developing and in the deployment of that technology, the particular needs and characteristics of the marginalized population that, as you pointed out in, in your presentation of this question, uh, has very different uh, structural challenges compared to the population, the, uh, uh, the, the marginalized population of other regions. So I think that this is very relevant in terms of uh, Latin America, in which, for example, we have different challenges uh, uh, confronting the inequality um, for, for indigenous population, for women, for LGBT community. So there are different components that have particularities that are very local. And when technology is being designed and, and, and uh, in some way enforced <laughs> with a logical that came from, from a different place of the world, in this case, uh, majority of, from the US or, or the global north in general, there are a lot that, uh, that get lost in terms of the, the need of consideration of the, of the needs uh, of, of this marginalized population in other uh, places of the world. And I think that antitrust enforcement and antitrust regulation can help to uh, point a light in those elements and, and, and to show how there are a differential uh, harmful impact in many cases of this uh, business model that have been deployed in, in that way in these different regions of the world. Thank you, Manifas. I love the way that you articulated that about how antitrust is ultimately about power. And I think I'll definitely carry that forward. Um, we have a couple questions from the audience here. The first that I see is how can merger, merger regulation influence the concentration of power in digital and hardware platforms? Commissioner Slaughter, do you wanna take that one first? Sure, absolutely. So I think, um, one of the real issues that we have in digital markets is that platforms have accrued huge market power, sometimes through merger, sometimes not through merger, um, but their mergers have very rarely gone challenged. Um, they have uh, largely because it's sort of a different model than we had been used to been looked at as not eliminating direct competition and therefore not problematic. But if you look at the FTC's uh, lawsuit against Facebook, which is essentially over its acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp, uh, what the, what the uh, commission alleged there was that those acquisitions were done to eliminate the threat of competition and insulate Facebook's market share in social media. Um, and I think what we are, really committed to is taking a hard look at understanding the why behind some of these acquisitions um, and how the companies see them uh, as protecting market power and making sure that we can deploy the tools that we have to challenge them where appropriate if, if what they really will do is continue to build a competitive moat. Um, a really interesting document that I would commend to everybody's attention is the FTC's report last year on um, acquisitions by the major platforms. We put out a report using our 6B authority, documenting the ways in which five major platforms uh, exercised acquisition um, practices over the last several years. And it is um, fascinating to, to think about from that perspective. And I, and I think one of the value of the reports that we do, in addition to the enforcement we do, is it can help inform public policy, civil society, and other thinkers who are looking at not just individual transactions, but broader patterns, which is what I think we really need to be doing in these markets in particular. Maria Paz, do you have anything to add about merger regulation uh, influencing the concentration of power? Sure. So definitely it's something that is missing in terms of the enforcement uh, to look in a more stricter way uh, this uh, killer acquisition that had been developed for years for, for the dominant uh, platforms uh, so far. So there are good examples of enforcement as the one that was pointed out by the commissioner. Uh, there are others in Europe. 
but because of uh, these uh, cases, they don't fit well in the traditional doctrine and theory of how uh, antitrust uh, evaluate the possibility of harm of these different mergers. Many of them have gone under the radar. Uh, many of them haven't been covered, for example, for the obligation of notify this operation. So we only know about them because of the of the press or, or because uh, uh, they are already implemented and they are causing uh, some kind of harm in, in the market or for the users. So the thing is that uh, definitely one, one thing that needs to, uh, to be updated globally, even in the more advanced jurisdiction as the US and, and, the, and, and the EU, is the doctrines and the theories of harm that are uh, uh, built to uh, identify when this uh, acquisition can be harmful for the competition and for the final user at the end. I think that also uh, the, in this, there is a, a very uh, relevant characteristic. I don't want to get te too technical, but you, you have to remember, uh, probably everyone have here uh, at, at this point, that the digital uh, platform in general, they benefit from, from network effect. So in general, also, that means that they have a natural incentive to cover uh, uh, adjacent markets, so collateral markets, and, and grow uh, by killing some uh, services or by acquiring innovate, innovative companies that maybe they are not compete exactly in the same service of the dominant platform, but they are very close and they are able to benefit from this exploitation of a digital ecosystem. Uh, and this need also that the, the the doctrine and, 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 and the jurisprudence regarding, for example, the impact of the conglomerate merger evolves to consider this uh, um, digital ecosystem as a different figure when you are analyzing the possibility of harm in, in the acquisition of digital companies by, by dominant uh, uh, big tech companies. So I think that, that it's a little bit more technical, but those are elements that uh, are uh, yeah they are being reviewed in many jurisdictions. For example, I can provide the case in Latin America of Chile. Recently, the, the, the national prosecutor, economic prosecutor, updated the guidelines for, for merger evaluation and considered some of these elements and integrate them into the assessment of the future merger in digital markets. Because we had already some cases and they fell short in the evaluation because the guidelines were not properly covering with this element um, uh, the, 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 the guidance for evaluating the, the possible harm in, in the digital merger acquisitions. Commissioner Sada, there's a question here from the audience about the FTC settlement with Amazon that you described earlier that I like. Uh, the question is, in the FTC Amazon settlement, the company was forced to only pay back driver tips, but no other compensation or action beyond that. If I steal money from someone, I will be punished beyond just giving back what I stole. Why wasn't Amazon punished similarly? Yeah, this is one of the huge problems with the statutes with which we work right now. Um, the and, and in fact, has gotten worse since we put out that case. The law does not give us the authority to seek punishments, monetary punishments, for simply violating the FTC Act. In order to get a monetary punishment, a civil penalty, we need to have a rule violation. Um, and there wasn't a rule violation in the Amazon case. Uh, for what it's worth, if they had a rule violation, that money would go to the federal treasury, not to the workers who'd been um, hurt. I actually think when I say it's gotten worse, what has gotten worse is that since that decision came down, the Supreme Court in AMG said, not only can we not get civil penalties for first time law violations, we actually can't even disgorge ill-gotten gains and provide restitution to consumers anymore in federal court. Um, so it is a giant problem. Congress has been working um, to restore that statutory authority. And the House passed a bill, although it was largely along party lines to do that. Um, I think that's important. I would like us to have first time civil penalty authority for first time offenses, because I think you're absolutely right that the deterrent effect of just saying, don't do it again, give back what you stole is not enough. Um, so 
notwithstanding those statutory challenges, one of the things we are thinking really, really hard about is how to effectuate more deterrence from the cases that we bring, how to really make them count and send the message to the markets that violating the law is not worth whatever profit you will make off of it. Um, that includes holding individual executives accountable where appropriate, making sure that the underlying business practices that um, resulted in the um, the the violation and led to profit for the company are stopped going forward and that they can't profit from them. It includes things like disgorgement of algorithms built off of ill-gotten data. Um, so we're thinking as creatively as we can. I have been pushing for a while for us to do a rulemaking in the data space so that we can activate more civil penalties there too. Um, but it is it is absolutely a deficit in the law. And for what it's worth, I don't think it's an accidental deficit. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has been very vehemently arguing, even against the restoral of our restitution authority, and they would lose their minds over civil penalty authority um, because they don't think that companies should have to pay when they violate the law. Um, but I think that they should. Speaking of rulemaking, another one for you, Commissioner Slaughter, what role do you see the FTC potentially playing via a rulemaking proceeding to protect privacy and civil rights online? Yeah, I, this is another area that's a, a real passion project for me. So first, let me say this. You mentioned that a bipartisan bicameral privacy bill came out this week. I think it's a hugely important development. I think it would be the best for everybody if the U.S. had a strong, effective federal privacy law with real substantive limitations on how data can be used, real penalties for violating. Um, and there are a bunch of great concepts in the law that was introduced. So I am excited for meaningful federal privacy legislation to move forward. That said, I worked in Congress for a long time. Um, I don't think that we should just wait for Congress to act. And until a bill gets over the finish line, it is still just a bill and not a um, actual statute that we can operationalize. So uh, for three years now, I've been saying we should use the tools that we have under Section 18 of the FTC Act to open a rulemaking proceeding to address the entire confluence of issues that arise from the widespread collection, use, abuse, misuse of data. Um, and I think that it is really valuable for us to create this public participatory record that can help document a lot of the harms in this space, which are not just what we traditionally think of as privacy harms, um, but also uh, bleed into civil rights areas. Um, I think about discriminatory development and use of algorithms um, or even non-algorithmic data based discrimination. Um, I think about the denial of access to opportunities or for things like housing and employment um, credit as, as areas that uh, we have a real role to play. And I think about the way um, uh, micro-targeted advertising can send different messages to different communities um, in ways that can be discriminatory and other and, and pernicious in other ways too. So I think there's a lot of work to be done here and I think we should keep plowing ahead. Uh, although I will be very excited if that good work is interrupted by a strong and effective federal privacy law that brings the US more in line with basically all of our counterparts <laughs> across, across the globe. I'm sure Maria Fass can personally attest to that. Um, but you, uh, Maria Paz, you've been doing a lot of work recently around uh, surveillance in Latin America during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I wanted to ask you how you think about privacy, surveillance, and civil rights and liberties. Sure. I think that this is very connected uh, with the previous answer that I provide about who uh, develop uh, the technology and who provides the technology in, in our region. So in many cases, these uh, civilian uh, technologies that have been deployed, again, they are provided by global uh, uh, monopolies that offer their services in our region. And in many times, again, uh, this, this happened 
uh, with not enough possibility of control uh, of these um, uh, companies in terms of the asymmetry of knowledge that there is in the region in terms of to understand how these technologies and the business models are deployed, uh, a lot of asymmetry in the way in which the benefits of uh, that technology are appropriated finally, and, and a lot of asymmetry in terms of how uh, strong are our legal frameworks or, 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 or right protection frameworks to really enforce an effective protection of uh, fundamental rights against the uh, negative consequences of the deployment of these surveillance technologies. So there, there are a number of, uh, of ways in which it, it's, this is very linked. And uh, it, it's particularly, again, uh, something that uh, is um, uh, very um, harmful for the more marginalized communities, uh, uh, the people that it's, it's uh, structurally excluded from the society is the one that is not considered in the in the uh, developing of these uh, technologies and they are not considered in the in the uh, acquisition of these technologies and deployment of these technologies in many times that are public private partnerships many times supported by international uh, uh, financing bodies um, and, and none of these elements are really regarded again as different elements of who hold the power and how to make accountable the ones that hold the power. So in your introduction also you, you highlighted your own work in, 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 in uh, business accountability uh, and I think that that's, it's a very big part also of uh, the, the conversion between consumer protection uh, antitrust enforcement or regulation or competition regulation and, and, and data protection uh, regulation and enforcement. Those are different uh, uh, points of entry for finally hold accountable the different companies. And what we have seen uh, in the deployment of these surveillance uh, technologies, particularly uh, that was stressed during the pandemic and all the technologies that were deploying with the excuse of the pandemic and many of them with purposes that uh, persist beyond the pandemic um, is precisely that, that we don't have the mechanism for really hold accountable and, and to have more transparency in, in the way in which uh, these business are carried out and the way in which the particular technologies are being implemented, the way in which the governments are negotiating them, acquiring them, providing public funding belonging to all the citizenship for, for acquiring them. So I think that, that all that it's very intertwining and, and we really will benefit of uh, strengthening these different uh, legal frameworks and, and possibilities of enforcement in order to ensure that finally uh, the power is held accountable. Thank you. That concludes our conversation for today. Thank you again, Commissioner Slaughter and Maria Paz for your generosity today and thank you all for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful rest of RightsCon.